Today we're going to talk through a little experiment that you can do by hand. The little dot is a rare earth magnet. It sticks very strongly to the metal table under the sheet. And this wooden piece is a little gadget I made with a peg that the cord goes over at one end. And the cord swings freely on this. I'm going to flip it over so it holds the cord on. And then I'm going to connect the end of the leash to the rare earth magnet. I'm going to pull it down to a level. And now I'm going to imagine pulling the sled to the right and watching the magnet get towed along by the leash. It makes this kind of beautiful, graceful curve. And the question we face is, what's the equation of that curve? Here's the start of our mathematical model. We're going to imagine one point sliding along the x-axis at constant speed, dragging a leash of length 1, and the other point at the other end of the leash, tracking along behind it. Now there's an angle, theta of t, that's made by the leash with the x-axis, and that theta determines the x and y position. Let's write down the equations involved. First, I'll sketch things out. To save a little bit of time, I'm going to speed up the video of me drawing the picture. I actually did this a lot more carefully. So if we think about the point located one unit away from t0 at an angle of theta of t, its coordinates are given by t plus cosine of theta of t, and 0 plus sine of theta of t. Now at this point, a lot of people get stuck. And the reason is, we haven't really described the curve yet. For instance, if theta of t was a constant, we'd just be pulling out a straight line. If theta of t was some really weird function, we could describe this weird-looking oscillating curve. And neither of these is the curve that's dragged out by our magnet. So here's the additional condition. It's not just that the point is on the other side of the leash. The point is being pulled by the leash. And that means the tangent vector of the curve points in the same direction as the leash at every time t. That's not now what I'm we're just talking gonna about pause here. here for a minute. After all, if the leash is exerting a force on the magnet, surely the acceleration of the magnet should be tangent to the leash, and not the velocity of the magnet. The reason we get away with this simplified model is because the friction of the magnet against the table is extremely high, so it doesn't really ever develop any momentum, and the velocity and the acceleration are essentially in the same direction throughout the whole pull. If we were pulling a mass that was sliding freely against the table, it would oscillate back and forth on the end of the leash, kind of like a swaying trailer. That would be a way more complicated model than the one we're doing here. Now here I've drawn the tangent vector to the curve x prime comma y prime. And now I'll draw its opposite, minus x prime comma minus y prime. This negative tangent vector will make the same angle theta t with the x-axis that the displacement vector does. And that means that the tangent of theta of t is equal to minus y prime over minus x prime, which of course is the same as plus y prime over plus x prime. Now we're going to actually do those derivatives. In the numerator, 
we get cos theta of t theta prime of t. And in the denominator, we get 1 minus sine theta of t times theta prime of t. We now almost have a differential equation for the function theta of t. But to get it in standard form, we have to solve tan theta of t equals cos theta theta prime over 1 minus sine theta theta prime for theta prime. So let's do the algebra. Since it's not particularly difficult or interesting algebra, I'm going to speed through it a little quickly. Here I am getting all the theta primes on the right-hand side and factoring them out. Then I'm multiplying through by sine theta and using a trig identity to arrive at our final equation, sine theta equals theta prime. Now we need to actually solve that differential equation. Remember the way that we do this is by putting all the thetas and theta primes on one side of the equation, leaving only functions of t on the other side of the equation. Now we're going to integrate both sides of the equation with respect to t. Since theta prime dt is the same as d theta, we can write the right-hand side as a theta integral of just cosecant theta by itself. The left-hand integral is easy. The right-hand integral is something we learned in calculus class, but you can always look these things up. It turns out to be minus log cosecant theta plus cotangent theta. We still have to solve for the c. Now when t is 0, theta is pi over 2, so we can just plug those two values in to get an equation for c. The solution is that c equals 0. We now have an equation for t in terms of theta, but we want an equation for theta in terms of t, so we have to solve the equation t equals minus log cosecant theta plus cotangent theta for theta. We'll start by rewriting cosecant theta plus cotangent theta in terms of sines and cosines. We see that it's equal to 1 plus cosine theta over sine theta. To simplify this, we're going to have to use the trig identity e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, a trig identity so important that I call it the mother of all trig identities, the moat. Let's start by writing down the original identity. e to the i theta equals cos theta plus i sine theta. Now e to the i theta is the same as e to the i theta over 2 squared, so we can go ahead and use the same identity with theta over 2, and then square the resulting expression. Collecting the terms without an i and the terms with an i, we get two formulas for cosine theta and sine theta in terms of the cosine and sine of theta over 2. These are the half-angle formulas you learned a long time ago. We're now going to use those half-angle formulas to rewrite 1 plus cosine theta
as 2 cosine squared theta over 2. And then to rewrite our fraction, 1 plus cosine theta over sine theta as 2 cosine squared theta over 2 over 2 cosine theta over 2 sine theta over 2. Of course, canceling the cos and the 2, that's the same thing as cosine theta over 2 over sine theta over 2, which is cotangent of theta over 2. Plugging this back into our original formula for t, we see that t equals minus log of cotan theta over 2. But we can simplify that using the laws of logarithms to arrive at t equals plus log of tan over 2. Exponentiating both sides, we get that e to the t is equal to tan theta over 2. Returning to our original formula, we know that x of t is equal to t plus cosine theta, and y of t is equal to sine theta. That means to express the right-hand side in terms of t, we're going to have to solve for cosine theta and sine theta in terms of tangent theta over 2, which we know is equal to e to the t. Sine theta is going to be the easy one to start with. We know that it's equal to 2 cosine theta over 2 times sine theta over 2. Multiplying and dividing by cosine of theta over 2, that's equal to 2 cosine squared of theta over 2 times tan of theta over 2. Or 2 tan theta over 2 over secant squared theta over 2. But now we can use the tangent secant identity to rewrite the denominator using the trig identity secant squared x equals 1 plus tangent squared x as 1 plus tan squared of theta over 2. Having written things in terms of tan theta over 2, we can rewrite them in terms of e to the t. Then, with just a little more algebra, we can rewrite our expression in terms of e to the t in terms of our hyperbolic trig function, in this case, the hyperbolic secant of t. To deal with cosine of theta, we'll start by using our half-angle formula again cos theta equals cos squared theta over 2 minus sine squared theta over 2. Factoring out a cos squared theta from both terms, we get cos squared theta over 2 is 1 minus tan squared theta over 2, or 1 minus tan squared theta over 2 over secant squared theta over 2, and we can use the same trick we used a moment ago to rewrite the denominator here in terms of tan squared as well. Here we get 1 minus e to the 2t over 1 plus e to the 2t. This is immediately a little confusing, but we multiply through top and bottom by e to the minus t, and we get this expression which we can recognize as a quotient of hyperbolic sine and cosine. In particular, it's minus sinh over cosh, or minus the hyperbolic tangent of t. We're finally there. We can now write x of t 
is t minus the hyperbolic tangent of t, and y of t is the hyperbolic secant of t. This parameterizes our curve, which we call the tractrix. Now it's worth pausing for a moment here to think about what we've done. We started with our experiment with the magnet and the leash. We modeled that by a parameterized curve that stayed one unit from the point t0 and had a tangent vector pointing towards t0 and an initial position of 0, 1. Now the first check to see whether we've done all this calculus correctly is to see whether this parameterized curve has those properties. So here's an animation of this parameterization with a tangent vector drawn in. You can see that the tangent vector really does point towards t0 all the way throughout the parameterization. Now it's less clear from this picture that the point x of t, y of t is always at unit distance from t0. So that's what we'll check next. Here I've picked out two points on the curve and connected them to their corresponding t0 pairs on the x-axis. Are these two chords the same length? Yelp. Let's try it again for two other chords. Once again, it works fine. Now we're going to complete the circle. We've made a model, we've solved the model with some effort, and gotten a specific prediction for what the magnet's going to do. So now we're actually going to test that by looking at what the magnet does compared to our prediction. Now this kind of closing the circle isn't often done in a theoretical math class, because after all, the model is a perfectly natural mathematical object, whether or not it is a model of anything. But I like applied math too much not to actually try it. So here we go.